not require uh, deep partisan uh, divides. First, I think we really do need a pro-American patriotic energy strategy. To grow and be secure, we need to develop our own resources. You know, great countries, great countries throughout history cannot sustain their greatness if they're dependent upon ever increasingly uh, unstable sources of energy. The Romans, I'm sure, had supply line problems in their great uh, development of their great empire. Eventually, it collapsed from within. Uh, and similarly, the United States cannot depend, as we have, in increments not discernible to the naked eye again over a sustained period of time, 50 years, we've allowed ourselves to become increasingly dependent upon foreign sources of oil. More than half of our oil comes from outside the United States. Roughly $300 billion leaves our country without being taxed, without creating any jobs, without creating any investment in our own country. And it goes to countries, by and large, outside of Canada and Mexico, that are either completely unstable and could be hostile to the United States, or already hate our guts. But yet we continue down this path of spending $300 billion on a net basis to go to countries that creates repression in their own regimes in their own countries and creates serious problems, I think, of stability for the world. We've, but the, the strangest part of this is that we have more BTUs of coal than Saudi Arabia has energy units of oil. We have huge natural gas resources and have billions of barrels of proven oil deposits that can be exploited safely. We invented nuclear power, but today it would take an act of God uh, to be able to expand dramatically uh, that source of power that is the greenest source of power uh, and pro would provide um, stability uh, in a very unstable world. Even with these natural advantages, we run a trade deficit, as I said, that is larger than the trade deficit we have with China. But here's the good news. We have the means by which to change all this and to develop our own energy resources safely and efficiently. The greatest innovation of the last decade that I'm aware of isn't the iPad, although I can't live without mine. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I get great pictures of my granddaughter on it, and that's really important for me. But even, even better and more important in terms of, uh, of, of, of innovation would not be that. It would be the combination of two old technologies, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracking, the combination of which has created an explosion of reserves of natural gas in our country. Just a decade ago, the amount of proven reserves of natural gas in the United States was less than 10 years, and there were people talking about its ultimate decline and elimination in the United States. In fact, you may remember roughly six or seven years ago, billion dollar investments were made to import liquefied natural gas from the Middle East and other places to come to our country because of this declining resource. Today, natural gas resources, because of the combination of these two technologies, the innovation that comes from that, natural gas resources are over 100 years in reserves. We can develop a strategy around this that would allow us to have green, low-cost sources of energy to reindustrialize our, our country and to be able to propel high-wage economic growth. You would think that that would be a cause for celebration. You would think that we would pause and if we had a Nobel Prize to give for this particular innovation, that we would celebrate it and hold it up high as an example of American ingenuity and American might. But instead of that, the Obama administration is not giving out any awards. They're, ba ba they're making it harder for the development of it to occur. EPA is embarking on new rules to uh, restrict its development. The Obama administration is proposing new taxes on the industry because it polls well, I guess. I'm not sure why the, the natural gas industry is put into the, the larger uh, oil industry and therefore is demonized and new taxes uh, are being proposed. And environmental groups based on sincere concerns are attempting to raise alarms about damage to water quality. Imagine if we had a true energy strategy that meant that what goes on in the Middle East was not so important to risk the lives of young Americans in that region. Imagine what it would, what it would be. Imagine the $2 billion a week that is spent in Afghanistan to provide stability in a region that would be less, less important if we developed our own strategy of energy in the United States.
imagine the investment necessary to get this energy to market, the billions of dollars of investment that would create hundreds of thousands of new jobs in our country, uh, high wage jobs if we focused on it. So here are four things that could be done that I don't consider to be partisan or ideological. This should be something that the left and the right could find consensus on. One would be to end the slowatorium, not the moratorium because that's gone, but the slowatorium to start granting permits and speeding up development in the Gulf of Mexico. If the de facto moratorium that has been in existence, that's slowly kind of getting out of the way now, uh, continues, 220,000 barrels a day of oil will not be provided to the market, which means hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of money will continue down the path outside the United States without any benefit to us to places that do have the oil. Secondly, the United States Department of State should approve the $20 billion Trans-Canadian Pipeline, which would create immediately 100,000 U.S. high-wage jobs over the next few years and reduce our dependency again on the Middle East. By the way, a great majority of the equipment for the pipe and for the infrastructure necessary for the exploitation of, this, of these resources in Canada and for the refining of the resources as they make their way into the refining areas of our country, close to 100% of the machinery and the equipment will be made by high-wage American workers. And uh, the benefit of this far exceeds just the idea of creating energy security. It creates an economic stimulus that would be far more important than anything that's been proposed in Washington today. I honestly believe the third thing that we need to do is to eliminate the strategy of using food as the basis of, of, uh, of, of energy, and we should phase out the subsidies of ethanol that put pressure on food prices and deliver an incredibly high-cost energy supply. probably proves by any reasonable by any reasonable doubt why I'm not running for president because that's the kind of thing that doesn't go over real well in Iowa apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, rather than attempting to pick winners and losers through tariffs and tax credits and grants and guarantees and loans, left-handed Albanians please get in this line to get your tax credit, right-handed Croatians please get in this line to get your loan guarantee to create this massive infrastructure around picking winners and losers through government, what we ought to do is use the power of government for the things that it historically has done magnificently, which is to fund basic research, to allow the market to have a greater say in what renewable energy sources should work, and make them competitive on a cost basis, not through subsidies and through the getting in line process, because it hasn't worked, obviously, but restore American greatness by funding American innovation to allow for the disruptive technologies to lower cost to get to the place where we can have a renewable energy economy the right way. The second great challenge is one that creates huge burdens for long, sustained long-term economic growth, which is our health care challenge, and you all know this oh so well. When I was a candidate in 1994, um, I kind of, you know, I enjoyed being a candidate most of the time uh, because I got to listen and learn. I got to kind of wander around and pick the people I wanted to hear from to get better at what I did. And so I, I went to see uh, the top education policy advisor that I was aware of at the time and, and asked his advice on what a candidate should be talking about as it relates to health care in 1994. And he pulled out a napkin and he drew a triangle and on, at each point he put the words quality, access, and cost. And his point was to this rookie candidate uh, he said, any increase in the emphasis of one point of the triangle would adversely impact the other two. So too much quality would increase costs and limit access. Too much access would increase costs and lower quality. Higher costs can increase quality, but it would limit access. And on and on it went. And he finally said, the only way that you can solve the health care challenges for people in Florida is to pour more money into the system. Now, you may remember I was a Republican and a conservative. That was not what I wanted to hear as the Bush plan. Uh, but in fact, that's kind of what we've done, is we've assumed that the paradigm that has existed in healthcare can't be changed. And so, in fact, it's been true that uh, there is a, a, a three-pointed uh, challenge and the overemphasis of one does create challenges in the other. But the simple fact is that more money has not solved that problem. We have poured significant amounts of money, both at the state level, in the private sector, and certainly in Washington, D.C., and we've had little improvement to show for it.